Hi, and welcome to Module 7 of a brief introduction to game theory. In this module, we're going to discuss behavioral game theory. Behavioral game theory is an aspect of game theory which has a, as its goal a tighter connection between the predictions offered by game theoretic models and the kind of behavior we see in laboratory experiments and more real-world behavior. There are many ways in which behavioral game theory works like this. We're going to discuss one in this module, which is to go beyond our sort of simplistic assumptions on utility functions and consider uh, a broader class of utility functions that in many cases are informed by insights derived from psychological experimentation. Okay. Um, so that's where our focus is going to be here. You can also think about behavior game theory in terms of learning, but just not really covering learning too much in, the, in this, these, this lecture. We're going to not focus on that here. Okay, so so far what we've been talking about is a pretty simplistic way of writing utility functions. So we have some utility function, which is a function of some individual actor one's um, outcome, and we often say the utility actually is just the outcome itself. We don't have to, but that's what we've been going with for simplicity. Um, this actually turns out has a lot of assumptions embedded in it. It assumes that individuals prefer outcome X, um, and they prefer more of outcome X, the more they get of outcome X, and they prefer it linearly, which means they don't change the rate in which their preference works, right? So the difference between getting one and two is the same as the difference between getting two and three to them. This is pretty constraining in a bunch of ways and doesn't necessarily match what people behave. Um, some simple ways we can change utility would be to incorporate risk preferences. Here, a utility like this, we would say is risk neutral. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of why that is in, this, in these lectures, but take my word for it in this case, if you have a utility that looks linear like this, you're risk neutral, which means basically um, a lottery that gave you an expected value of x would be the same to you as getting x directly. The risk itself doesn't really lower your utility, your expected utility for the lottery. We can make different kinds of utility. We could have it equal, um, say, x to the one half, the square root of x. In this case, you're risk averse. Utility, rather than looking like this, so if this is utility, if this is x, this is a linear utility, utility instead looks kind of like this. So that's a like concave utility, we say. And as you get more and more of that outcome x, each additional unit of x is less useful to you. Um, so it's decreasing returns to your benefit from x. Some other cases you might be risk seeking. You might have utility looks like this, and that would look more like this. With each additional unit, you get more benefit from it. These are all different ways of incorporating risk, and if you go on in game theory, you'll, you'll see more how risk ties to um, uncertainty, which we don't talk about too much in the course of this lecture. Um, we're going to focus on a little different aspect, which is to tie what we've been talking about so far to laboratory experiments um, and how individuals actually behave when playing these kind of games. So let's start first with um, the PD. We're doing a lot, a lot of stuff involving the prison dilemma, and we see that we have you know, this game right here. We'll go back to this game again. And there's cooperating effect. I'm leaving up the extra strategies here. <laughs> um, and here's the PD we've seen several times now. And we said again, as before, is that there's only one equilibrium of this game, which is that mutual defection. Both actors defect. But um, when you play it in the lab, that's not the case. You actually do get substantial cooperation among real people when they play the prisoner's dilemma. And why is that? Well, one simple argument is that people are rational. They do irrational things. They're not behaving rationally, blah, blah, blah. They don't know how to actually play the game correctly. That's entirely possible. But behavior game theory isn't focused so much as a, on a lack of rationality, but rather on positing alternative psychological mechanisms that people might rationally respond to and choose differently from what they might have chosen given a more simplistic utility function. So let's say that these utilities here in this game matrix 
are not just util are not the full utilities, they're the immediate payoff to the actor for taking action. They become the same as the utilities if we assumed a simplistic utility function that looked like this. So if they have if they get a payoff of two, the utility is two, and so on. If this is a utility function in that case, the same results hold. There's mutual defection to the only equilibrium. But let's start considering alternative um, utility functions that might be based on some more um, psychological um, aspects. And let's consider first a simple altruism. What might that look like? Let's say instead of caring only about your own payoff, you care at least somewhat about your opponent's payoff. Right? You want other people to do well. You're altruistic. So let's say an altruistic utility, sub A, looks kind of like this. So now instead of being dependent just on your payoff, it also depends on the other person's pay outcome. So instead of being the, the sort of normal self, normal game theory selfish one, right? Um, you instead have a utility function that depends on your own payoffs plus your partner's payoffs. And let's say it looks like this, to be real simple. You care about your own payoffs as before, plus there's some constant A times your opponent's payoff. And to be, avoid being too excessive, let's assume for this case that A is greater than zero and A is less than one. So you don't care about your opponent as much as you care about yourself, but you do care about them more than nothing. What happens then? How does the, P, how does the Pigeon's Dilemma change in this context of this simple um, altruistic utility function? Well, we can go through and change utilities from these payoffs down to here. Let's see. What do we get? Well, the 2 now becomes 2 from over here, right? Plus A times your opponent's 2. So we have 2 plus 2A two for both actors. How about down here? Well, now you are still getting 3 if you defect, but they now get 0 plus 3 times A. And to be clear, you're getting 3 plus 0 times A. Same thing over here. We have 3A and 3. And over here, we have 1 plus A for each player. OK, so what happens now? Well, now we're not comparing 2 to 3, which showed that D, that defection was always dominant strategy. Instead, we're comparing 2 plus 2A to 3. Well, is there a situation in which 2 plus 2A is greater than 3, such that you would want to cooperate? Well, that's true whenever a is greater than or equal to a half. And again, the half comes up a lot just because of the payoff numbers we chose. Um, so if you care about your opponent half as much as you care about yourself, you can have a situation in which you won't want to de deviate the defection if you're both cooperating. So cooperation can be in equilibrium. Now, in fact, it goes further than that. If a is greater than a half, consider what happens when your opponent is defecting. Your utility now there is three halves a. Sorry, it's three halves. You plug in a. And your utility for defecting is one plus a half or three halves. So, in fact, in this case, if a is greater than a half, you prefer to cooperate even when your opponent defects because you're so happy that they're getting this big benefit for the, from, from betraying you, basically, that you're okay with that, and your utility for that is high enough to lead you to cooperate even when they defect. So in fact, if you're sufficiently altruistic in the simple altruism model, cooperation becomes a dominant strategy. So this is important to note here, is that there's nothing irrational about this in the slightest. Rational choice theory still holds. You have complete and transitive preferences. They're represented by a utility function. You're optimizing your outcomes you can achieve given constraints, which you do by maximizing a utility function. Nothing is different from rational choice theory. This behavioral game theory approach does not change the fundamental nature of rational choice theory. All it does is say, my utility function is more complex than a simple selfish utility function might imply. I care not just about myself, my own payoff, but I care about others' payoffs as well. And what you can do with this kind of model is tied to laboratory experiments. 
you can try to tune the value of A to get a sense of how people actually behave. So this is the a modified PD using a simple altruism rule. What about other rules? How about the other games? How about the ultimatum game? Ultimatum game, recall, the only equilibrium there was to give the other person nothing. You offer them nothing, and they say yes. Right? As you might imagine in practice, that doesn't happen. First of all, people who get offered a very small amount don't often always say yes, right? They get insulted. They don't want that small amount. Um, and second, the people who are offering, maybe realizing people say no, don't offer nothing. They offer something. Sometimes it's small, but oftentimes it's, it's reasonably large and close to half. They don't, offer, they don't usually offer more than they get, but they off, usually offer substantial amounts to the other person. Even though the strict selfish utility function game theory would say you don't have to do that. Does this simple altruism model also help us there? Well, what are your payoffs? Let's see. If you offer someone else x, then you get 1 minus x, and they get x. So here is your payoff. You can simplify, and you get 1 minus 1 minus a times x. Now, you're okay doing that. You're okay having x be positive, non-zero, um, if it gets you a better utility fund, it gets you a better payoff. But here it doesn't, because a is less than one, 1 here, right? So this term right here, multiplying the x, is negative. So the more you give the other person in this model, the less you get. So simple altruism doesn't save us in the ultimatum game. You still give the person nothing, because no matter how much you're happy that they get something, you get less, and you still care about yourself more. So this doesn't work so much. But there are other possible um, psychological models we can use. So let's try another one. We'll, we'll start off with the... Oh, oh that's what I want. Let's go to the ruler. Okay. Um, so we're going to start with the um, ultimatum and game again. But now we're going to try a different type of utility function based on inequality aversion. Inequality aversion means it's not just that you care about the other person, it's that you prefer the inequality between your payoff and their payoff to be smaller, all else equal. So we can write it out like looks like this. So your utility function, and this is going to be piecewise, which means it's different in different regions, and I'll get to that in a second, will be a function of both your payoff and their payoff, like so. Whenever you are getting less than they are getting, then your utility looks like this, x1, so what you get, minus some constant a, times the difference between their higher payoff and your lower payoff. So what that means is the bigger, the bigger difference between them and you, the lower your utility is. Similarly, we can write another one. If you get more than they do, then you also are unhappy. But now we're going to consider um, a b, a different constant, and it's the difference between your higher, utility, your higher payoff and their lower payoff. So there's two aspects to this. If you're getting more than they're getting, you are unhappy to the extent to which the difference is large. Similarly, if you're getting more than they're getting, I forget what I said last time, but you get the point, um, then you're unhappy as well. So. What we how does this work in practice? Well, as you might imagine, um, people in general are more unhappy, you know, maybe more unhappy if they get the short end of the stake than the other person. Um, but that said, they might be unhappy with both. But how does this work for the ultimatum game? Well, you might first think about whether or not you're unhappy for getting um, different from them. And that's possible. But you don't have to go there even. You can even consider just a, just. Um, the, the first outcome here. Think about what they want. Don't think about you, think about them. In an ultimatum game, they have to agree to your offer. The question is, would they agree to zero? Well, zero would be the maximum possible difference between them and you. So if, they, if, you, if you offer them zero, what would happen? Well, zero would get, their utility would be zero. This is from their point of view, not from your point of view. It would be zero, because they're getting less than you are. Zero minus a, times 1 minus 0, which equals negative a. Now, negative a is less than 0. And since 0 
is what you get if you reject the offer. You can reject the offer if your utility function looks like this. Which means that player one, the one making the offer, can offer you nothing because you will reject it. And since both players are rational in this case, player one will not want to have you reject the offer and get zero. Player one will see how much player one can still get will have you accept the offer. So what's that amount? Well, it's some x right, that they offer to you such that the difference between their payoff, which is 1 minus x, and your payoff, which is x, that's the payoff, that's the utility you get given these inequality averse um, preferences you have, given that they're st they'll still offer you less than they get. Um, that, as long as that's bigger than 0, you're willing to say yes. Because right? your other option is to reject and get zero. So as long as the utility you get from their actions is greater than zero, you will accept. And the utility you get is actually zero because the difference upon rejection is zero minus zero, which is just zero. Okay, so um, if, as long as this is true, I'm going to say it again slower, more slowly. This is the utility you get if you accept their offer of x. This is the utility you get if you reject because you both get zero, so you plug in zero for x2 and x1 in both cases, and the whole thing is just zero. So when is this true? Well, it's true when x uh, time, uh, minus, and this is two, this is plus 2ax minus a is bigger than zero, or 1 plus 2a times x is bigger than a, or finally, x is bigger than a over 1 plus 2a. So as long as x is bigger than a over 1 plus 2a, you will accept their offer, and there will be an ultimatum, success, successful ultimatum. So we can plug in numbers to get a sense of what this looks like. As a is a quarter, you would get, sorry, if a is 1, then you get 1 over um, 1 plus 2, which is 3, and you get um, x has to be greater than or equal to 3, to 1 third. If x is, a is 1 half, you get x is greater than or equal to 1 quarter. If a is 2, you get x is greater than or equal to 2 over 5, and so on and so forth. Okay? As you care more about the inequality, they have to give you more. Right? And in the limit, as a goes to infinity, x has to be greater than or equal to one half. So as you care about any differences maximally, and in which we refuse to accept anything that's different from equality, they must give you an equal share, because you, otherwise you'll say no. And they will give an equal share because they get a half out of that that way, and the alternative is zero. So in this case, inequality averse preferences get you the result that you that individuals will say no to low offers and that compels the perfectly rational first player, and both players are rational here, that compels the first player to look ahead in the game tree, do backward induction, and realize that the second player is going to perfectly rationally say no because they have inequality versus preferences, which are totally allowed in rational choice. And then because of that, um, the first player will offer them more to make sure they say yes to the offer. So that's it. So there's a ton more in behavior game theory, and much of what we're going to do um, going on in this is to is to think about different examples and different kind of games in which there might be an interesting approach, an interesting way of um, attacking a problem by incorporating some some different kind of psychological insights into our utility function construction. Thank you very much.